thanks for coming. Um, I'm William Brent from Audio Technology over in Korea. We used to be neighbors, <laughs> uh, but then as soon as I started here, A Tech got moved into its own space, and you guys came here. So. Uh, I'm going to talk about two software libraries for a specific programming environment called PD. That uh, actually, that's probably the first thing I'll do is just show you a little bit of PD and what it is, and and then we'll get into these specific libraries. There, this is what they're for: audio analysis and designing new instruments. Uh, so we'll get into all those details. Let me start just with the PD introduction. And this is open source. You can download it. This. Google Pure Data. PD stands for Pure Data. Uh, and basically, it's a graphical programming environment where, let me make the font bigger. <coughs> the idea is to make it relatively easy for artists, people who work with video, sound, um, make it easy for them to write their own programs and manipulate different kinds of media live in real time. So. The simplest example would be I can make a little number box controller and plug that into an oscillator, a sine wave oscillator, and multiply that signal by something less than one to make the amplitude smaller, say. And then we can listen to it. I can throw that out to a DAC, a digital audio converter, and then bring the frequency up. All right. And you can do silly things like make a little metronome. Every 125 milliseconds, we can make it change frequency. Pick a random frequency between 0 and 3,000, say. Stuff like that. I can make it go faster or slower. So that's just uh, that's just waiting there. And you guys, uh, how many are programmers? You mostly CS people. Okay. Uh, the cool thing is, and what we're about to get into is, you can write your own modules for this, right? Each one of these objects is just some C code. It's all written in straight C. Uh, so if you know how to write in C or C++, uh, you can make your own stuff, and other people use it. So it's sort of like a higher level environment. Um, just to bring the idea of video in or graphics slightly. I'm going to take, here's a microphone <coughs> signal. I'm going to put an envelope follower on it. So there's my, the loudness of my microphone right now as I'm talking uh, in dB, from 0 to 100 dB. So if we want to, say, take a, make a little square, I'm not going to explain all of this stuff. But here's a little chain that makes a square. make a rendering window. I made a square, and I can change its color by sending messages to this color thing in RGB, right? So 100 zero, zero would be a red square. But because we're in this live environment that has real-time audio and video integrated all in one place, I can take that same number, divide it by 100, say, and pop it in here. And so as I talk, I can make it more or less red. Or I could go grayscale by making the, the G and the B all follow. So pure white when I get really loud. Shh. Wow. Right. <laughs> Stuff like that. So and this is this is silly, right? But imagine what you can do with uh, video and stuff. So you can take live video streams, you can have uh, prepared clips of video images, stuff that you trigger uh, based on instruments you're playing, based on whatever you want, a bunch of controllers, whatever the, the purpose may be. So that's PD in a nutshell. Um, and I, I really think all programmers should know about it because it's just a great open source project to contribute to and uh, you can probably make it do anything you want. So back to the, the ideas I'm talking about here. Um, Tambor ID is the audio analysis library that I worked on. So basically just a bunch of modules that can analyze sound. 
uh, as it's happening in real time or non-real time. You can load pre-recorded sound and just shoot through it and analyze it in order to do all sorts of things. Um, and that's what we'll talk about first. So there you go. That's what I just said. There are two kinds of objects in it. There are feature extraction ones. I mean, that's the audio analysis ones. Those are called, the result of that is called the audio feature. So feature extraction uh, for audio. And then you have to deal with all that data that you extract. Uh, how can you accumulate it into a database and organize it uh, and then send new information in and try to classify it or things like that. So those are the main two classes of objects. And I'm going to just show you a few example applications that I made. Um, that goes along with the library. You can download the library of objects, and then I also provide um, a set of PD programs that show you some things you could do with it, including everything you see here. Uh, we'll hear a vocoder and actually an automatic wah, uh, wah wah pedal kind of sound. Uh, target based granular synthesis that just means you can try to, uh, you can analyze a, a big sound file, break it up into a bunch of tiny grains and then try to approximate some new sound, like talking to a microphone, and approximate that live sound based on the grains of sound you analyze ahead of time. It'll make more sense later, maybe. Uh, you can identify instruments in real time. One of the first things I did with this was just uh, to be able to identify different percussion instruments in real time as a performer was playing. If we wanted to do something where certain video will be triggered with certain instruments and stuff like that. So you can train it for instrument recognition. These spectrogram plotting, um, order sounds, organized sounds by timbre. And then this, this picture right here is the idea of a timbre space, where again, you, you take a sound file, split it up into hundreds of thousands of tiny grains, short grains, and analyze all of them, uh, different sorts of features. And once you've got that complete, you can plot the grains like this, according to whatever axes you want. Like this might be volume, and this might be pitch. And then you can mouse over the grains and hear, uh, hear what they sound like and see how they all relate to each other. And oh yeah, one more there, vowel identification. So you could, with a singer, you could uh, distinguish whether they're making an ah, ee, boo sound and maybe do different things, audio effects or video, based on the vowel they're singing. So let me show you that in action. Here's the first thing. So this is a little patch. Everything in PD, the PD programs are called patches because you patch together stuff, right? So this patch just shows you all these audio features for any sound file you want. You can load whatever sound file. I've got uh, a woman speaking here. Oops, that's me again. It and this scrub bar lets me just move to any spot and even freeze her voice, right? So you can see the waveform at the bottom going it by. It sounds as though they appear to you are not only different from those that are really new, but it's All that stuff, right? So I can go to any spot and, and see how these change. One thing you'll, you'll see right away is when someone's saying a vowel sound, the, the brightness of that sound, or how much high frequency content there is, is going to be pretty low. Like here's, let's get that vowel sound going. Where, where was sounds? The sound. There. All right, so brightness over here is pretty low. One is maximum brightness. You back it up to the S sound. That's really a bright sound, right? It has more high frequency. Stuff. So that's what brightness is telling you. Centroid is kind of similar in the, the whole spectrum of audio from 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. What's sort of the, the center of gravity of that spectrum? And that gives you a, a centroid in hertz. Uh, lots of different things that I won't go into to detail. Uh, but the most powerful ones are the, the uh, bark spectrum and the bark frequency capstrum features that are let you sort of compress really number heavy spectrum information, which might have 1,024 points in it, and compress it down to just a few points, but still get meaningful, uh, some meaningful information about what the spectrum is like. So it's sort of a data compression thing. And that's really good for classification. Um, here's 
an example. So that's all for you know, seeing information and, and learning about the sounds you're seeing. Here's an example that uh, does spectrum measurement, that centroid idea. Not for learning about the sound, but just to control an aspect of transforming the sound. So we've got this, why don't I disconnect the, the treated version? I've got this recording of a guitar that a student played last semester. So this is the read sound file object to just play that wave file. Now what I'm doing here, I'm going to break that connection and go back to the wah-wah version, is I'm playing that sound and then throwing it into the spectrum centroid analysis thing, finding what, what the centroid is, and using that to control the center frequency of a filter. So when you filter part of the sound and, and that has a moving center frequency, you can get that kind of wah effect. So instead of having to pedal with the wah, it sort of automatically responds to the uh, the sound of the guitar, because when you pluck a note, it's really bright and it has a high centroid right during the pluck, but then it mellows out uh, when, it, when it goes and becomes more uh, sustained. So that's what, here's what this sounds like. just a simple example to show that you can use this to control sounds. Uh, this is one thing. You could use centroid to control where the sound is spatialized in a room. What if you had eight loudspeakers, which is pretty common for uh, electroacoustic music. You could spatialize your sound based on this information or all the other information that's out there. Let me do, I don't know. I'll show you one of these because CS people would like this kind of so this is a similarity matrix for, you can open any sound file you want, and using the analysis stuff, you can plot a similarity matrix where it gives you some measure of uh, how different points in the sound file relate to other points. And you can see there's a, a white diagonal through this, right? White is a is perfect match, means it's exactly identical. And so any grain of sound is identical to itself, and that's why it's white. But then in the neighborhood, you can see, you know, this moment in time, it's kind of consistent in sound for a little while, because it's, it's locally white. And you move a little further, and, and that is too. And when you hear the actual sound, you can see that that's... Uh, continuous soft utilizing. You love this sample. That's probably the moment of continuous, the S sound. And then right after that, it goes into soft, continuous, soft. So these are probably two S sounds right back to back. Continuous soft and relaxing. Right. Yeah. What attributes are you are you considering? Just frequency or a whole bunch of different things? This is that one I mentioned that's the data compression version of the spectrum. So it's like a compressed so simplified the, spectrum. The main eigenvalues? Is it that like a eigenvalue decomposition in the main principal components? Or? It's sort of like, it's supposed to be like PCA. Okay. Uh, okay. But yeah, <laughs> it's, yeah, it's basically a reduction of, of the spectrum into, I think I did, actually this has, uh, let, me, let me just check. Uh, the first 20, so it's 20 dimensions of the spectrum, yeah. basically. So yeah. it's, be PC, yeah. it's a reduced dimensionality yeah. of the spectrum. Yeah. Yep. That's cool. Yeah, and so this, this lets you see it, you know, and, and you can plot other things with this, spectrograms and capstrograms and things like that. But you could also use this information, uh, all this analysis information to classify sounds, <coughs> keep all these analyses. And then, like I was mentioning with the percussionist, when that new sound comes in live, analyze it and instantly in real time compare it with that entire database and say, okay, that was most like this. And then you have a guess as to what it is. I'm gonna jump, there, there are a lot of these, and you guys should download these, they're all on my website. Um, if you wanna check them out in detail. But here's the one that's going to be the bridge into the instrument design stuff, which is that timbre space um, idea. So let me analyze the same sample you just heard. Here's the thing I don't know if you can see. 
can barely see this. I could probably make the points bigger there. So here's a here's a timbre space plot that I can mouse over. Each one of these grains of sound is a little I think it's 46 milliseconds or something, right? So that sound continuous, soft, and relaxing. These grains are all nearby each other in the space because they sound similar, right? Those don't sound that similar. You can kind of mouse around this little space. Um, I'm going to get <laughs> analyze something different. How about I have five oboe samples? We'll look at those. All right, so here's a bunch of oboe sounds. Now I got to make this little selection thing bigger. Those are all together because they sound similar. Right? right, so it's a way to, to sort of, you could use it as a research tool to see how sounds relate. Um, but what I'm interested in, is, on top of that, is to use this as a basis for making some sort of a new instrument where you could move around in this timbre space physically, you know, with your, your hands or with some sort of uh, tools or you're doing stuff with drumsticks. Um, that's all that's all possible. So that means I need something more interesting to use than a mouse <laughs> or a trackpad, right? Um, so let me pull up a couple options for that. One, actually, right before I move on to that, is you can navigate this space instead of with your mouse um, with another sound, right? So if I continuously anal analyze uh, someone playing an instrument, every snapshot that goes by, like every few milliseconds I take another snapshot, the result of that analysis is a position in 20 dimensional space. You know, here we're looking at two dimensions, right? But you can have 20 dimensions or 100 dimensions or whatever. And that analysis, as it's happening in real time, just constantly flying by, you can think of it like a cursor flying around in that 20D space. And whenever it gets close enough to one of these grains, it can play that sound. And so that's what I tried to do here with this bassist. Uh, so his, we've got a contact mic on his instrument. And he's playing piano samples, grains of piano sounds. And they're treated with a little smoothing and reverb and stuff. But it tends to... Uh, it tends to focus on the sustain part of the piano sounds. After, here you'll hear the attacks. Right, when he goes to that high end, because it's bright enough. But then other low sounds, right, that's all piano resonance. And they sound so similar, you might not even notice that's a piano. treatments to it, like the little smoothing out and overlapping the grains, adding some reverb, uh, little bits of pitch shifting and stuff like that. So once you have access to this and you can make those connections between uh, what the musician is playing and the sounds that come back, you can do uh, all sorts of things. So uh, and you'll, you can cut me off at any time when it goes, comes to time. <laughs> um, this is, OK. This is the link into the, the digital instrument library. So there, there's the timbre analysis library, and then there's the digital instrument library. Um, here are the motivations for it. First, thanks to the, the video game industry, we have really cheap and amazing sensor hardware available, right? The Kinect is 150 bucks, and it's actually incredible, <laughs> right? The Wii Remote, even, that was revolutionary when it came out, it's been 
has it been 10 years now? Not quite that long. But whatever the case, it's been out for a while. And for $40, you get an accelerometer, an infrared camera, a gyroscope. Um, that's pretty incredible. Multi-touch surfaces like the trackpads built into laptops, iThing devices that you can uh, use. Not to mention built-in laptop hardware. Like this thing has a camera in it, a light sensor, an accelerometer, um, like I said, the trackpad, the keyboard itself. All that stuff is potential um, control input. These are control input devices that are just sitting there ready to be used. So the hope is to have a, uh, a software library that lets you pull in all of those things and do whatever you want with it into PD, because once you get it into PD, like we saw earlier, you, you can do whatever you like. Um, none of this really matters. This, the main purpose for it is, uh, or sorry, the, the beginning of it, where it, it sort of originated, was just teaching a class here on instrument design. I wanted to build up a set of tools that would let students just get to the act of making the instrument, rather than figuring out how do I even get that data. Um, and so I did that last year, and now for future versions of that class, this will just be a, a set of tools that, that they can use, and that anyone can use because it's on the, the website. Um, here are the components of it. Um, like I said, I, I pretty much mentioned all these things. Touch OSC is, is a program that runs on iPhones, pads, and pods um, that sends data wirelessly to, to your laptop. The uh, infrared blob tracking, that's the thing I'm most interested in right now. And that's enabled by the PlayStation camera, that PS3i camera, it's $40. It's 125 frames a second, um, which is, what, like five years ago to get a camera that fast, you really had to pay a lot more money. And Reactivision is software that enables a project called the Reactable that we might not have time to get into. Boss Skeleton is command line software, runs on, on any platform that uh, gives you, it takes the Kinect sensor and gives you the joints of a skeleton. Uh, and it's multi-user too. So you can see, see that stuff there. Here's the first, show you this one. Here's that same timbre space that I was navigating with a mouse. Um, whoops. This is a bunch of speech grains, thousands of speech grains, and that's me sitting in my office. I put on these uh, gloves that have reflective tape on them, same kind of thing you put on your, your mailbox so the cars don't run into it. And then the camera is watching me, and the camera is also shining a certain wavelength of infrared light at me. This is, are you guys all familiar with? infrared blob tracking, so it's a standard thing used in, um, in computer animation. And now instead of one cursor on my mouse, I've got this whole space, and every fingertip that I, that I put this tape on can be a cursor that mouses over these grains. So here's my first attempt to play with this. Keyboard interface, and now we're at the point where we can really 
make any kind of motion, do any kind of sound. And like I was saying, I really got a feeling of this pinching, making this kind of sound. And, and you even kind of sympathetically start to mouth the words you know, as you're doing it. So all sorts of weird relationships start to pop up uh, when you make these unnatural connections. So I think I'm going to just skip to the last thing, um, the most recent project I've worked on with this. So I, I have other examples of the different modules I mentioned here, right? Like the laptop stuff and the uh, Connect stuff. But the, the most developed project at this point is this, uh, what I'm calling the gesturally extended piano. And here's a movie showing what this tracking looks like. So I put um, reflective markers, just like that tape on my fingers, right? I put those on my hands as I'm playing the piano, right here and right here. Just these spheres, these reflective spheres. And when you do that, you know, yeah, I get four XYZ coordinates. And I can go through timbre space, like I mean, I've grafted a timbre space into that little uh, green box there. But you not only get the, the XYZ coordinates, you have all this relative data. Like look at that when I'm moving my wrist like this, that line between the blue and yellow dot gets shorter, right? And so that's something you can use as a trigger potentially. That can be a slider. Um, so instead of playing the piano and trying to manage a set of knobs <coughs> and faders on a mixer to change the way the sound is coming out, I can just do this, right? Or I can the line between my two hands, that's another fader. Right? I, can, I can make that control something. The speed of my hands, the angle of my hands, right? Because that line right here, that's changing angle all the time. So when I play a note and do this, I can shift the pitch or I can do whatever I want. So, and those relationships can change from one point to the next in a piece. Um, so the latest thing I've done is to make a well, here it is. Um, there's the camera overhead. You can see the markers on my hand. And this is me just messing around with the first set of mappings I came up with. This is four mappings that I stepped through with a, a little foot pedal. The first one's really simple. It just lets you shift pitch by the angle of your forearm. So again, the angle of that line between the blue and yellow dots. But it means I can do vibrato now. I can play a note and, and wiggle my arm, <laughs> which you normally can't do on piano. mapping is just a bunch of classic 60s uh, effects applied to the, the piano just to make it sound ridiculous. <laughs> timbre space, so you can imagine just a bunch of grains scattered all over the playing area. And this is um, about five minutes of percussion samples. And you notice that the same motion gives basically the same sound. one is that there's you'll hear a basic sound effect uh, processing the basic piano sound but I can also record snippets of my playing and then play them back 
Kind of, you remember that voice sound, the woman speaking thing where I can scrub through? Same idea, except I can on the fly click my wrist, or it's this wrist, uh, to re start recording, play something into it, and then scrub through that sound by just moving my arms across like this. Right? And then when I, as I'm scrubbing through, when I stretch my arms apart, that line between these two, that can be used to pitch shift that frozen scrub sound. Oh, and this hand is pitch shifting too. <laughs> You'll see this. specific piece, right? So I can write a notated piece in the, the regular way a piano score is notated and but with this extra information about how your arms should be moving as you're playing certain notes and then get a really specific, you know, real time transformed sound kind of electroacoustic piece. And that's that's about everything I wanted to get to. So yeah. Happy to take any questions. Especially educational, um, having to do with piano technique. If it got more refined with more markers, um, in fact, I'd be surprised if there wasn't already something kind of going in that direction. But I'm mostly interested in you know making it an open source tool that this will all be on my website for anyone to download, and then composers can see this and performers and say, hmm, I, I wish I could take that and then do X, Y, and Z, um, and hopefully that'll kind of enable that sort of work. Because I'm really interested in, in this kind of thing of flourishing and going in all sorts of directions, so, yeah. Do we know if it's like something that's done elsewhere in the academic field as of now, or are you kind of like out there on the edge with, I mean, because we know the motion tracker technology, but is this something that currently receives a lot of visibility or a lot of work from different people in academia? Not, not tons, I mean, the thing is, so I've, I've put this out there, uh, for conference papers and stuff, and, and showing in conferences, but yeah, they, the comments from reviewers are things like, well, this technology is not very cutting edge. Because yeah, the the technology itself, the infrared blob tracking, that's really old. I mean, that's been around for a long time, but to me, that's not the point. It's, it's what are you doing with it, you know? <laughs> uh, and so, in that respect, yeah, it, I think it is cutting edge. And I know of a couple other examples, specifically, actually, I should point out, couple links. Um, Jaime Oliver's work is really cutting edge in this way. Oh, you'll never get his site though because there's a chef named Jamie Oliver. <laughs> <laughs> so Jaime Oliver is from Peru. He's done some really great things um, that use video tracking, not infrared blob tracking, but um, video tracking. So you can check out his work. And he has one, for instance, that tracks just the contour of the hand with regular visible light. So you shine lights down on, on the hands, and there's a you make a black background for yourself. And then it can uh, track the, the shape of your hand, how many fingers there are, the angle of the hand, and all that kind of stuff. So you can make whatever you want just in, in open air like this. But there are, there are tons and tons of really developed instruments that use this technology. It sounds like one of the challenges is even sort of going from that place where you have the, the tool development and refining it down to almost a language. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you sort of find as a challenge to sort of say this is the new like, Q 
keys and waves and motions, rather than just bring it from that experimental stage to the kind of finality. Well, that's that's the process I'm going through right now. Where, like I said, I I've, I've basically improvised with it a lot, and I've got a sense of of what things are innate to it, sort of idiomatic with it. Um, and the next step is going to be translating that into a score that another performer can read and actually make sense of and do similar things. And so some degree of standardization there. Um, but I mean, in a way, it almost feels like a cop out. Because <laughs> But you can constantly change those mappings, right? You never, if one thing gets boring, then you just switch to another mapping, you know? So the question of how deep and refined your expertise and mastery over any specific mapping is, maybe it's a little shallow at the moment. Yeah, I'm interested in making it deeper and deeper. Yeah. It almost seems like the big thing that this does is allow that data to be really easily accessed by other people. So that they can make their own. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's that seems like the thing. Just watching it, that's really unique, maybe, or you know, really impressive about it is that it it lets other you know, you want to make your own motion control mappings, go for it. And right. You've got all the tools in place now, and that's something you know that would take a lot more work in different contexts. So. Right. Yeah, that's what I'm really hoping to see different kinds of things pop up as a result. <laughs> you know, just, <coughs> just a comment on something that I find fascinating. In addition to a bunch of others, is we've seen yeah. keyboards yeah. playing other instruments. That is, you get right. a fake from a keyboard or a whole bunch of things. But you allow people to do the reverse. I mean, the, <laughs> the bass playing piano, well, that thing is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so how did, did you present this to other musicians, saying, oh, cool, I, can really, I want to really try this. And, What's yeah, the reaction from musicians? This is the piano project is is all really new. I, it's something I just finished last month. Um, so the yeah, so far the reaction is really enthusiastic. People want to try it and, and play pieces with it and stuff. So I've already got two um, composer friends of mine that are they're gonna write pieces for it. Awesome. <laughs> they're on board whole hog. So yeah, definitely enthusiasm. Uh, give it a shot. Yeah. And I tried, I, I tried to design it with that in mind, yeah, because, again, the, the hardware is cheap. There's only one camera. The, what you have to wear as a performer, there's no power issues, no batteries, or um, no wires or anything. You do have to attach those markers, but otherwise you don't even really know it's there. So it is really portable that you can just you know, show up and install it on any given piano and, and do it. Um, so it's travelable and uh, portable. So let me just, maybe as a last thing, um, point you to my website. It's just my name.com. So if you want to download any of the stuff that I, I talked about, um, go here. And it also has links to PD, which everybody should check out, uh, right here. I, it's not very well labeled, <laughs> but this is the link to PD. Uh, you can use it, pure data course. So yeah, anything that you'd like to download that you've seen today, uh, you can get here. So that's about it. Awesome. Thanks, Juan. Yeah. Okay. And you've got to run. I've got to run, yeah, I'm office hours. I'm already late. <laughs> you being a responsible person. How long are you going to be there today? Um, I'm out at 3.30. Oh, cool. So you, you have some time if I start my at 1.30? Give it a shot. Of, I'm yeah. sure you'll have people, but I just yeah. want to show you what I'm working on real quick. Yeah, I, yeah. I'd love to see I will Just you. make sure um, I'm about to start putting it all into one big pack. I just want to make sure I'm on the right track. Yeah, come on by. We'll check it out. You said you said Sandra. <laughs> <laughs> they know where to find you, right? Put a note. I don't know. He doesn't care. I think we said. I think we just did this session. Dr. Black also needs this car. I'm looking forward to that. I don't want to do this. I'll just go through this. See what we're going to talk. Okay, why? Well, I have trouble.